Freddy Dog. What's up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Activate Radio, and we are here to activate your mind while we entertain and educate. And you know, every episode is brought to you by Reebok. Hashtag be more human, boys and girls. And we're excited because, John, it's Friday. And we're ready to party. We're ready to party. <laughs> it's happy Friday. Listen, Monday was serious. We talked about serious stuff. We activated our minds. We reached out to people. But it's Friday, man. Let's get down. Let's get down. So, dude, I think we start in the sports roundup. We want to catch up on what's going on in the sports world. We got to talk about the NBA. And my homeboys, the Cavs, <laughs> they're, they're making a series out of it. John, what's your thoughts? My thoughts are, LeBron, you're out in six, fool. Oh, Those are my thoughts. Oh, oh, you need Kyrie. Can you, you couldn't even support your boy Kevin Love to score more than, what, two points? I, oh. You can't put it all on Kevin. You, you got to be a team player, LeBron. Get it done, son. So here's my take on it. LeBron was a straight bully. Now, not only was he a bully, but he actually hit a jumper. That's, that was, that was, I mean, look, my jumper's been broken since like seventh grade. His shit's been hurting lately. The, the difference between Corey Gregory's jumper <laughs> and LeBron James' jumper is LeBron James gets paid about $400 trillion more to hit those jumpers. <laughs> that is a correct statement. Now, going back to my, my jumper being broken, now I would say that him hitting jump shots, I mean, Steve Kerr eloquently said... I will let LeBron shoot jumpers basically all day long. I'll get beat if LeBron Absolutely. beats a shooting jump. It's a great move. Now, when Kyrie goes 11 for 14 and he is balling on you like Uncle Drew, then you got a problem. If LeBron's hitting jumpers and Kyrie's playing like that and Draymond gets phantomly thrown out, conspiracy, I think. I don't well, know. what I noticed you said three times is if. And when you got to yeah. say if a lot – uh, that implies that there's a question, and if there's a question, I got uh, news for you. A team that went 73-9 and nine is going to beat you with that many ifs. Yeah. the pro You know what? Here's interesting about Golden State. I used to say, oh, if they shoot the three, they're going to win, but they they basically like wiped out that if. Cause there's they no more shoot, if. They just shoot the three from like – what I believe is like a high school half court shot. Dude, they have right? redefined right? the Yes, you're exactly right. They've redefined the game. They've made it normal to pull up six or seven feet behind the NBA three point line. Like that is that's so absurd. It's so that, absurd. That's one thing I heard when uh, Magic Johnson was speaking on it. He was like Oh, Michael Cooper, they'd guard him out there if they had to, but they never had to worry about anybody pulling up from that distance in those days. No, no way, right? They, they couldn't hit it. It's like it's like uh, you got to believe guys like Clay and Steph, the way others practice free throws, they practice the quick release, you know, 32-foot three-pointer. And, 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 and that's – if you look at a team that's broken a record for most wins in a season – you have to look at why, and if I could put my finger on why, outside of the fact that everyone contributes, it's the mm -hmm. fact that they are the only team in history that has been able to shoot the three-pointer from as far as they yep. do. Yeah, absolutely. So you're calling cat? You're calling Cavs in six or Cavs in seven? Is that what you're calling? Cavs? Did you say <laughs> Cavs, boy? Come on, Warriors in six. All right, I'm going Cavs in seven. We'll see who wins. I hope to God it's me for Ohio's sake. Yeah. <laughs> now, hey, Stipe brought home a championship, but, you know, yeah. Yeah, which is still good. All right. It's time for some UFC Octagon talk with our resident guru <laughs> slash guy who's been in the UFC forever, John Fosco. I got four people we're going to talk about, John. We're going to talk about Kimbo Slice. Okay. Epic. Ronda Rousey. Yeah. The man, your, your homeboy, Brock Lesnar, because I know you're a WWE oh, fan. Just behave. <laughs> our man, Connor, <laughs> Connor McGregor. So let's let's start off by talking about Kimbo, what he meant to the sport, what his impact was, and really how sad it was that he passed so young. Yeah. 
the first thing I'm going to say about Kimbo is, is I had uh, the opportunity to meet him about two or three times. I think it was three times. And um, he was really a nice guy. I mean, yeah. he was really a nice guy. And he is a product of the Miami backyard kind of scrapping system. That, that really put MMA on the map in Miami, which put MMA on the map for Florida. George Masvidal, who's a friend of mine, I mean, he used to fight in the same backyard fights as Kimbo. And, and Kimbo, dude, I mean, he's a genetic freak. He was a phenomenal football player. Um, he was a bodyguard. And the guy just, the, the guy had natural, if you looked at the way he moved his body, he mm-hmm. had natural boxer's movement. Now, yep. he was not a grappler. I think we all know that. But what he but what he was was up until I want to say UFC 100, he was the biggest draw for an MMA event ever in the United States or or, or anywhere for for that matter. When he fought, I believe it was James Thompson in Strike Force. I believe they got a, a 6.8. Um, standard Nielsen rating, which was the largest um, for a full fight. So Kimbo Slice drew more people up until Lesnar came into the game than anybody. So people really, really were attracted to him. And I think he brought in a, a, a new demographic. Mixed martial arts is known for not having um, a large population like boxing of African-American fans. And I think Kimbo connected and he brought them over. And for that, the sport's grateful. We're all grateful because the great thing about mixed martial arts is it's a global sport. It doesn't matter what color you are, what race you are, it, it, you know, every, everyone's welcome and, and, and everyone is effective. And, and I think Kimbo bridged the gap for um, African-Americans to come into the sport. And, and for that, I, you know, I'm eternally thankful. And I think many other, other people are. And I think he was just not just a sideshow. He had real impact on the sport. And that's what a lot of people sometimes don't get, I don't think. Yeah. I mean, he brought eyeballs to the sport that um, were not previously looking at it. Now, you could argue, well, are those – do we want people looking at a Kimbo Slice fight? Well, it really doesn't matter because at the end of the day, I think the thing that resonates most – with skeptics of MMA is you find anyone find me a sport that has better sportsmanship than MMA. And these guys are literally trying to, you know, crush each other. And there is no sport I've ever seen the sportsmanship. And I think that is what Kimbo Slice gave uh, many, many new people the ability to witness. And that's a great thing. Yeah. Excellent. R.I.P. Kimbo Slice. Absolutely. Rest in peace, Kimbo. So I want to talk about Ronda for a second, but mostly just about, I think, women in MMA in general. And you said something off camera that really I I believe, too, is that I think it started with Ronda, but these chicks are coming to the octagon to straight toss down. Like, on another level, and you said your brother – yeah. Even mentioned like he likes watching the women better. He 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 texted me straight up after Jessica Andrade at UFC 199 went cyborg on Jessica Panay and just looked like an absolute savage. And uh, he said, "Man, I like I like women's MMA, women's UFC better than men's." And and what I'll say to that statement is number one. Um. These women, they're not sideshows, okay? They are, they are fighters to the level that, I, I promise you this, they will beat the shit out of you, average tough guy like <laughs> yeah. me or Corey, <laughs> who, who's in, who's in you know, good shape. Go, they will beat your ass at 135 yes. pounds. I mean, they'll, they'll ruin you. You have no clue how, 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 how skilled these women are number two they don't feel each other out men feel you know they they got to feel the speed the range the length women it's like i've said this before it's like dude you stole my boyfriend when that bell rings you're gonna have to answer for it 
and it's like boom you know and it's just a brawl and there is also great talent i mean we have yeah. misha tate who who honestly has shown she shows guida style hard yeah you know we have ronda rousey who's a supernova we have chris cyborg who is the terminator incarnate you have holly holm Who's who's whose boxing technique is is off the charts? You have Joanna, I can't even still pronounce her last name, Dredrajic, who's <laughs> our 115 pound champ, who I believe, and a lot of people may argue this, but I believe is the best technical striker, man or woman, in MMA. So, bottom line, women's MMA has been nothing but successful and amazing for the UFC and sport. Dana White had to eat his words when he said. <laughs> Right, a woman will never fight in the UFC octagon. Now he's so glad. I'm sure he brought it in. It's unbelievable. Uh, at this he's point. glad, and he and so is his check in. No. Yeah, I'm sure of that. So last two guys in MMA, and then we'll we'll roll on. Is Brock Lesnar's coming back to UFC 200, kind of out of nowhere yeah. to fight Mark Hunt, which I don't think that's really the topic. But do you believe the UFC scrambled? Because they lost Connor on that card to get what would be the best number two that they could. It's not John Jones in DC. It's almost like we need another guy that has pop like Brock. Now Connor's fighting at 202 now, but it's like, do you believe this was just like their best their best case scenario that they could pull together? I do because if you're going to call UFC 200, uh, you know your your most monumental event. Um, there's three people who could be on it: Connor, Ronda, or Brock. Yeah. Nobody else has the pop. You could stack it with epic fights like Jones and Cormier, like Velasquez and Brown, like yeah. uh, uh, Misha and, and um, uh, uh, Nunez for the title fight. But it it doesn't matter how much you stack it. You need that one just off the charts name that draws and Brock Lesnar, you got to understand he, he is so interesting for so many people because he's not your typical mixed martial artist. Yes. He is an amazing college wrestler and that's mm-hmm. the difference between him and CM Punk. That's why he can, it's, it's appropriate for him to be yeah. in a cage because he has that background, but he also brings all, the WWE fans to watch. So, yeah, I, I do think that's why they brought him, Corey. And you can comment if you want or not, because it might end up on MMA Junkie, just because you're such a you know connoisseur in this world. What do you think it cost to get Brock in the octagon? I mean, he's been out for like two years. John. Minimum, minimum ten million. Really? Oh, MMA Junkie, write the story. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we'll move on to the hot seat. I really want to just get your take mostly on Brock. We already know Connor's a boss. We'll, I'm sure he's going to write his own story coming up soon. So we'll. we'll yeah, he better to focus on beating Nate. That's what he better do. I would agree with you. All right, John. It's time for the hot seat. Now you're the one sitting down. So is that seat getting hot, John? It's warming up a little bit. I got to tell you, man. So in the hot seat, we ask each other three questions that we make up off the top of our head to try to let the listeners learn more about each of us. And so actually we can learn more about each other. So John, seeing how you're sitting down, I believe it's my turn to ask you the first row of three questions. Let's do it. Are you ready? I am. Dude, I'm the most born ready. So John, obviously you've done a lot of different kind of businesses in your life. And it seems like you've always kind of stayed in your wheelhouse as have I fitness and yours in MMA or marketing, right? What is one business that you have not gotten in that you always kind of like think that'd be pretty cool to be involved in, but maybe it's not like in your wheelhouse per se, but you just like that style of business. Okay. Um, to be perfectly honest, uh, I owned for about two weeks when I was 19 and, and this is the answer, uh, part of the roofing company I worked for. Um, which was in existence for, for, for 30 years. And I had a dispute with the original founder. We, we saw things differently. Um, I obviously wanted to aggressively grow it. He didn't. But um, I would like to own but not work in a business like that. And the reason is because, number one, you're providing a service 
that is always going to, it's never going to go out of style, right? Everyone's always yep. going to need rows, right? True. And, and, and number two, um, 95% of your competitors, they approach uh, the business as a job versus a business. You like yep. will never see a company like even have like a logo that has like a, a font that, that you can't find like uh, on Google top 20 fonts. Like, yeah. like there's no marketing, there's no branding. And, and man, it's, it, it is a busy business. It's a profitable business. And it's a business where you could honestly, you can create a lot of jobs. And for young kids, we always yep. talk about what makes you a man. Man, you can employ a lot of young people and teach them what it is to be a man when they get up on that roof. So I, I, I think uh, the roofing business, just because I have experience with it. I'm going to stay with the with roofing. And I always say, like when I worked as a miner and I worked with men, I got advice from men on what was going on. Like they worked for 20 years in these type of jobs and they always had – insight on all kinds of things. Is there a piece of advice that you got from a fellow roofer when you were there, John, that kind of you carried on or just yeah. a way somebody did something, you know, yeah, shut the fuck up and work. <laughs> I, I remember, um, the guy's name was Phil Buckles. Sorry, Phil. I, yeah. I, I hope you're still alive. He was yeah. an OG dude. This guy was like 70 man. And, yeah. and, and he was still ripping shingle. And, um, I think I got up there and I was like, man, it's cold today. And I wasn't tearing off at the speed I should be because I was, I was a workhorse. And he just looked at me and he said, shut the fuck up and work. And I looked back at him and I said, all right. And I never, <laughs> ever went back up on that roof and commented again. I left all my comments for the ground. But once I stepped up that ladder, bro, I was, a, I was a horse. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Um, last Last question is obviously your uh, friends and business. We're all business partners with Guida. I want you to tell me one thing about Clay Guida, just because you're such a good friends with them, that everybody should know yeah. that maybe they don't. Okay. And I, it, something popped in my head immediately when, when you asked me, and it, it stunned me to this day. So I believe we were in Minnesota – I think he was doing this was this was at least seven years ago. Um, I believe he was doing a signing for the UFC. He was a guest fighter, and he had been in Minnesota um, a, a, a year earlier to either fight or be a guest fighter. So after the fights, we're all out having a couple beers, and um, everyone wants to eat. And uh, Clay's like. Um, okay, what do you guys want to eat? I think the only thing that's open is sushi. And we're walking down the street in Minneapolis. There's a group of about six of us. Mm -hmm. He walks by this 42, you know, mid 40 year old Asian woman. She says, Clay. And he says, Nancy. <laughs> and I go, wait a minute. I go, you know, like after they talk, I go, who is she? No, I'm, let me rewind. He says, Nancy, how you doing? He goes, we're getting some sushi, Nancy. Do, do, do you want to, we're going to take it back up uh, to the hotel and eat. Do you want to come have some sushi with us? And she was like, yeah, sure. Sure. That, 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 that'd be cool. I mean, this woman looked like she was an executive at like AT&T. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and he says, Nancy. And, and, and then like when I get a little space and we're walking, I go, Clay, is she like the important or like, like who is she? He goes, no, man, she's just a fan. I go, how do you know her name? He goes, bro, I was here last year. I was signed in here last year. He goes, she came out. I said, so how do you know her name? He goes, why wouldn't I know her name? I remember it. I met her. And I'm like, <laughs> this guy, like, like so I, would, cool. I would argue that less than 0.2% of people care enough. We got to remember Remembering people's names, and, and I'll so admit hard. that I'm bad at it. So I'm hard. really bad at it. But like anything else in life, if you want to remember it, you make it yep. a priority, right? Yep. This guy remembered a fan's name 
from a year earlier in a city he's been to twice. And, and he went and bought her sushi. It was like, I was like, this man is special. I want to work with him. I want to be with him. I want to be his, not be with him. I want to be his friend. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and it comes out. Yeah, no, no. no. I want to be his friend for, for, for the rest of my life. Because I don't know anybody else in this world That's unbelievable. that could have done that. It's unbelievable. And was she surprised that he remembered it? Yes. She okay, was like, okay. hey. Like, <laughs> l- l- like he was like, Nancy. And she's like, oh. Like, I was like, so, dude. I'm not going to steal your hot seat, but I'm going to add to it real yeah, quick. Yeah. Arnold did the same thing with my grandparents. Oh, he really? met him met one time prior. He sat down and talked to my grandpa for three to five minutes at the booth. A year later, they were in line at this uh, charity thing we did, and he called him by his first name. And my grandfather was so impressed that it was like it meant the world to him. You know what I'm saying? That dude, exactly, exactly, super cool. But all right, your turn, Johnny. All right, Corey G. (laughs) You have accomplished something that's that's really cool man and, and I, I we've talked about it like you know you're an endorsed quote unquote um fitness athlete for Reebok right so it's it's an accomplishment and and, and 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 again it's very cool what is the coolest thing for you about the whole process whether it be them like being open to it them being willing to pay you them mm-hmm. being like, what's the cool, what's the one coolest part for you personally about it? Well, I would say because of where I'm at in my career, it's definitely not the cash, right? I think that that's obviously a plus and I'll always ask for more. <laughs> John, you've taught me that if you add value, right? But always ask for would, more. Always ask for more. But what I would say is I think it's, I was on the other side so much, meaning I was the guy taking care of Clay. I was the guy taking care of Tiger, taking care of Arnold. Like I was the guy that was on the flip side. It feels, and I don't know how many times this probably really happened, weird and awesome to be taken care of. Like I used to take care of athletes and not only that part, but a company that wants to highlight the training profession to the level that they want to. And so when I came into what they call Reebok one, which is the trainer segment, I was thinking, all right, they're huge in CrossFit. They need to spread out a little bit to regular fitness. I mean, I was right. But when I heard the message, heard the message this week, this last week when I was at the summit about, we believe that your value is the same as not me personally, but the profession as a doctor, as a lawyer, like our society needs people that will make other people healthier. Um, It's a true problem in the the States and worldwide. And when they talked about highlighting a trainer as a pro athlete, as a big time professional and putting money behind that message, dude, I was like, these guys get it. And so I would say that's awesome because anytime a blue chip brand can see value in a small town, Ohio weightlifter, it's pretty cool. Yeah. That isn't a world champion. Uh, But I would say them taking care of me like I took care of athletes when I was at Muscle Farm, I would say that's the sure. coolest thing. Awesome. That's good stuff. Um, number two, you uh, you like to wear sunglasses a lot. What is Corey G's favorite brand? What's your go-to brand of sunglasses? So, I, a lot of people probably don't know this, but when I was a kid, I was a huge JFK fan. Like, I don't know why. I always really? read about it. Yeah. Really? That's I, interesting. All, I always read about him. I think my, my grandparents had some like big books about JFK sure. like around their house, and I got to read. And and I don't know. This is kind of a, a, a throwback story. Like I don't know if it was authentic or not. But I used to do like American Picker type stuff. I would go to these flea markets, and I I bought a really cool frame one time. And when I was uh, and I don't even know why I bought it. I don't think there was anything. There was something in it, but it. It wasn't why I bought it. I opened up the frame, and in the back of the frame, John, was a funeral card from JFK's funeral. Like, like the actual, like, like real. I believe it was real. The problem is I was probably nine years old. I don't know what ever happened to it. Like, I need to go look, but I actually remember 
shown it to my parents yeah. and my grandma. Like I found this in the back, like a buried treasure. I found this in the back. So right. JFK became somebody that I just did a lot of research on. Like I'm talking 12 years and under. Like I was just into it for some reason. He always, and a lot of his, the Kennedys in general, wore classic Ray Bans. Just the classic Ray Bans, from what I get gathered. Like I saw pictures yep. as you know before, and then um, I, that's just the look that I always in, like liked. And so when I was able to afford a pair of just classic hundred and fifty dollar black Ray Bans, I've been rocking them this as long as I've been able to afford them, which has been a few years now. And so that's I just bought a brand new pair. Like I wore out one pair. I just bought a brand new pair like a week ago. Nice. Very nice. So Ray, Ray, Ray Ban Classics. Numero tres. If you could have dinner with one person, um, uh, past or present, right? It, 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 this could be a pharaoh um, from way back when or someone who's living today. Who would that person be? Uh, what's interesting about you know both of our journeys, we've met so many cool people. I think that if I hadn't personally worked with Arnold, I would say Arnold. But because I've had dinner with Arnold, I don't have to use him in this scenario. It's undoubtedly Carnegie. Like it's not even a close second because every piece of like daily principle that I employed really some way or other has come from a Carnegie Napoleon Hill type of thing. The he his teachings were so impactful on the way that I operate, I would love to sit down and talk to him and have dinner. It would it would be awesome. Yeah. That's cool, man. Yes. That's cool. All right. So next, one of my favorite segments of the show is Johnny's Inbox. You, you got, got mail, right? Mail. You got mail. <laughs> so, Johnny, I know uh, we have a follow-up from last week yes. uh, with Jacob Bed. I know you wanted to touch on, so I'm, yes, I'm excited, sir. To, excited to hear about it. So Jacob Bed uh, last week asked us uh, if if he, what he should do. You know, he had a small personal training business with basketball players, but you know, he wanted to go get going going with the career. So we we basically were like, listen, man, keep going with your small training business because if it's small, you know, it, it, it can't take that much time. And then go try to get a job with a bigger company and climb the ladder. And and he thanked us and and he followed up with this. He said, you know, thank you. Da, da, da. He said, follow up question. Is there any material that you or Corey would suggest me to read to get ready for this? Yep. Or is there like a top three list of books that you think anyone should read? So, so um, I've told people uh, probably 10 million times the art of war is, is, is right there <laughs> for sure. in the Bible. So I'm not going to go with that. Um, Corey, why don't you go number one? I'll, I'll kick number two. Yeah, number one is – I'm going to come right back to Carnegie. It's the wisdom of Andrew Carnegie told by Napoleon Hill. Now, I was pretty uh, friendly with the Napoleon Hill Foundation for a long time because I was always repping that book. And I sold it even off my website for years. You can easily find it on Amazon or whatever. It's probably 15 bucks. It's a good read. You'll see a lot of parallels into how I operate it, but Wisdom of Andrew Carnegie told by Napoleon Hill is my number one. Very good. Very good. I would definitely go with uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale yeah. Carnegie. Um, yeah. I don't know. if Have you read that book or no? Uh, Cliff Notes. Never read it. Gotcha, back to gotcha. front. Yep. It, it, it's, a, it's a fantastic book that it, it just explains. I don't, I don't want to say sales principles. But it explains how to be a person that others not only look to, but respect and want to work with. So it's, it, it gives you very, like, I, I like books that are black and white, right? Maybe that's why I like The Art of War so much. It's just, bah, yeah. bah, bah, bah. this is a pretty black and white book of ways to be a sought after person in life and in the workplace. And, uh, that would, that would be, that would be mine. Um, if you want to hit one more, I'll hit one more. Yeah. Um, I would say that 
initially I would tell you rich dad poor dad if um, if you don't really have a concept of how money works if you do you know the difference between a liability and asset I would actually recommend the compound effect because in the compound effect it re by Darren Hardy it really explains like how you don't have to be like a superstar every day but like many wins daily compound over time into potential greatness and so what I also like is in the first paragraph he talks about waking up at five in the morning because his dad's dropping deadlifts in the garage I think I just oh really that. that for, for <laughs> yeah. that's like sold yeah sold and so I would say Darren Hardy the compound effect I've never met Darren Hardy I don't know him but his, his book was an easy read and it, it was definitely pretty impactful so nice, go ahead John. Nice. um I go with outliers of by Malcolm Gladwell. Malcolm, if you guys yep. don't know who Malcolm Gladwell is, he's written, man, he's written so many New York Times bestsellers, and he is just a special, special thinker. And yep. Outliers is about just kind of like people, I don't want to say who you don't expect to be successful, but what people do outside the box, outside of, you know, waking up early and grinding and, and stuff that me and Corey talk about a lot, but like outside of that, what people do who are like uber successful. And, um, it's just, it's just interesting because like everything else in life, there's not one way to get to the destination. There's, there's, there's many paths. And I think outliers by Malcolm Gladwell kind of articulates it very well. Yeah, I would agree. All right, cool. Let's move on to B Hall. I know you. Uh, yeah, B Hall, Hall. huge so, supporter. Uh, yeah. um, we got to. We're gonna. We're gonna give everybody his his straight up uh, IG handle, which is B Hall eight one five seven. B Hall's been supporting us from the jump, and he is a Ohio Republican Party Clark County field organizer. He just got the job. He wanted to let us know um, uh, the activate mentality gets you places. That's his quote. The activate mentality gets you places, and he's so stoked um, that he got this job so quick. So, nice. uh, B Hall eight one five seven golf clap. Nice Good job, B Hall. Good job, B Hall. Keep it rolling. We know you listen to Rage. We know you listen to Rage. You send me that too. We'll talk about that later. Yeah, I wonder if uh, old B. Hall probably knows John Kasich then, huh? Probably, oh, of course. <laughs> All right, last but not least, we got Joshua Berthold. I know Joshua reached out. What's he got going on, John? Okay. Hey, John, love what you and Corey do at Activate Media and on your podcast. I wanted to pe pass on a great movie I watched this weekend so that you guys can pass it on to those who need it. It was called Unguarded from ESPN. Uh, when it says from ESPN, I'm going to assume that maybe it's a 30 for 30, but either way, it's called Unguarded. Mm -hmm. And it was about Chris Heron and his oh, yeah. basketball career while addicted to coke, heroin, opiates, and alcohol. Check it out if you haven't seen it already. Thanks, and keep up the great work. Um, you heard the man. You heard uh, Joshua Berthold. His, his handle is Joshua.Berthold. Thanks for the thanks for the uh, heads up. Uh, I have not seen it. Cor, have you seen it? I have not, but Maurice has ran into him in several occasions because they spoke in some of the same circles and said that Chris has had a massive influence um, since the Thirty for Thirty, and that it not only created a business for him, but like it took off faster and bigger than he ever envisioned. And so I heard he makes. I heard it's. I heard it's a great, a great thirty for thirty. I haven't seen it though. Gotcha, gotcha. You know, he's making money, but he he's he's helping people now. Yeah, it sounds like his story um, has been great. And here's the thing with the thirty for thirty, and I can shed some light on because I went through it a little bit with Maurice because sure, I was around sure. the whole time he shot it. It's a great thing, but there's like not like a high monetary value for the person. Like it, what it does for them is it gives them a platform to go and do things like Chris Heron's doing or a second chance for a guy like Maurice Claret. Right. But it's not like they hit the 30 for 30 and they got paid a million dollars. Their life's different. Like, Oh, it's, no. It's all, it's all you know, promotion. 
Correct. And so I would say that Chris, Maurice, and a lot of these guys have used that to help a ton of people. They just needed that one little bump again to get a little exposure so they're able to do that. But, yeah, it sounds like the guy's done a great job, and I've heard nothing but good things. Awesome. So, awesome. Yeah. Well, he, I mean, that kind of leads us into what we, what we hit on every show, and that's kind of uh, – our, our two pillars of addiction, we take addiction very seriously here, um, uh, especially opioid addiction. Uh, last week, we talked about benzodiazepines as well, which are which can be dangerous and, and, and are if they're, if they're not taken the appropriate way. But um, we definitely want to hit on our two pillars. And, and our first pillar um, is nobody who's part of the familia um, or nobody that the familia knows is allowed to take any kind of narcotic painkiller ever, ever, if they have a dental procedure. Dental procedures, you can make it with Tylenol. Don't tell me it hurts too bad. You can make it with the leave. Listen, I tore my bicep and it rolled up to my face and I took <laughs> Tylenol, okay? So you can <laughs> you can get by, you know, if someone pulls your tooth, okay? That, that, that's number one. Number two... Listen, we all respect everyone's boundaries in life. you got to give people their space. But when it comes to narcotic painkillers and the fact that they are synthesized heroin, that's exactly what they are. We need to cross people's boundaries. If you got to go in your parents' medicine cabinet or if you got to grab a bottle of pills from your friends, we need to be vigilant in crossing those boundaries to, A, have a conversation with the individual who's taking those and B, get the doctor involved so you can discuss how you can wean the person down and eventually off the opioid or whatever else they're taking. So those are our two pillars. We always welcome more advice. This is a problem that's growing by the day. We're trying to do the best we can to have an impact on it. We're going to keep trying. Um, uh, we, we just don't want people to die anymore, man. And, uh, and, and, and help us, please. Any advice is welcome. So from that, we roll into Corey G Fitness Time, John. Oh, uh-huh, that's serious. I want a toe spike. I want to, you're standing up. You're, you can do a toe spike. Yeah. <laughs> John, that's such bad bodybuilding advice right there. No, I'm just kidding. So today on Corey G Fitness Time, we're going to talk, we talk a lot about scheduling your day from a business standpoint having daily success habits. I want to tell you that you need to put your workout in in your schedule just like the meeting at 12 or 1 at 3. You need to have a date, a time. And so if it's like, okay, I'm going to work out Monday through Friday, I'm going to work out at 5 o'clock, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock. Don't be like, well, I'm going to try to get up. But if I don't get up, dude, then I'll just work out after work. That doesn't fucking happen, and I'll tell you why. Because, man, maybe the hot chick you work with's like, let's go grab a drink. I'm maybe going. Get, I'm going. Yes. I'm going. Maybe, maybe you get caught up at happy hour, which happens to a lot. Well, yeah, that, that would be the point. Right? Or, you know, it's like maybe you're just tired because you had a really shitty day. or okay. and, and what you should do is go work out because you'll feel better, nice. but you just can't muster up the – motivation. And so I'm going to challenge you to work out in the morning because there's no excuse. You, you always feel better when you come out of the gym, you feel like you can attack the day. And I'm not saying go work out at four in the morning. I know that John, you enjoy working out either in the afternoon or night, but you schedule it. Yeah. Well, that we, that's another one we can talk about. That (laughs) that That changes, that changes after you adapt. But I think the thing is like, but you know what works for you. And you can make those times on a regular basis. That's kind of the key. So it's like and, – and for me, I know that I'm a fucking grouch if I don't work out at 5 in the morning because I need whatever – Grouch is a great word. I am. Okay. Whatever goes on in here, more? we should. Okay. I want to use grouch and bum more. I think both <laughs> those are two words that we need to use more. <laughs> you know I love bum. I know you do. So I think it's like – it's one of those things like – I feel like I got to get whatever this is out of me in the morning so I can operate as a normal human. It's just the way it is. But I really believe that you need to schedule the time. Whatever that time is, make sure you can make it and don't fucking 
miss, John. Don't, Don't miss. miss. Don't miss. This is Friday. It's fun Friday. Don't miss. Don't miss. All right. Next, we're gonna we're gonna go to what we like to call the entrepreneurial meeting. So, John. John, are you there? I am here, baby. Excellent. So, in this entrepreneurial meeting, we're going to talk about... Pull up a chair, listener. Pull up a chair to we're the meeting. Pull up, pull up. Cha-ching. So you think you know money. Now, I'm going to tell you guys, we're going to give you a little inside look in this segment to an audio book that oh. John and I... Oh, oh, oh. An audio book that John and I are working on that we haven't told anybody about. I've released a little bit on my blog at Corey G Fitness, but you know, a little exclusive action here and there. But we're we're working on an audio book so you guys can be lunging and going to work and really uh, learning a lot about what it takes to be an entrepreneur. One of the chapters is so you think you know money. So John, let's give them a little snippet of what money's about. So money. For those of you who watch Game of Thrones, I'm going to give you a comparison. And for those of you who don't, I'm going to give you another comparison. The God of many faces is just like money. Okay? And if you don't watch Game of Thrones, um, going into a Halloween shop and seeing all the masks with all the different happy, sad, clown, wolf faces, that's money too. Money in business is every emotion and then some. It is the wolf that wants to bite your head off. It's the smile that tricks you into, you know, falling down into a pit of spikes. It sometimes is the, it is the person smiling who wants to bring you in and show you sunshine. It is everything in between. But what it's best at, it's best at tricking you. So what do you have to do with money? You got to know money better than money knows you. Okay, you need to understand what borrowing money, you know, what that means. You need to understand interest, how it works. You need to understand if you borrow money and you don't pay back an investor, like what they can do to you, what they can do to your family. And you need to understand when you're playing ball with real money, like you entrepreneurs or or entrepreneurs or, or, or wherever you're at right now, like if you're playing with real money, you can lose your family, you could lose your children, you could lose it all. So this game that we play called business and entrepreneurialism, man, there's great rewards and oh, there's it, it, like I call it, it's, it's the best sport in the world. But on the flip side, the majority, the huge majority, lose it all. And when you lose it all, you typically lose a lot of personal things with it, like your family, like a lot of friends who used to hang out with you because you could go you know, on vacations with them, but you can't afford it anymore, and they don't really talk to you anymore. So you, people change with money. And... Uh, it's just something that if you want to be an entrepreneur or if you want to be a businessman and you want to be self-reliant, man, you better know money better than money knows you. Yeah, and I'm going to take a little different approach, John. You, you articulated that great is that and there's so many people that are scared of money that aren't entrepreneurs that when you have some money, they treat you you different even though you might have never changed yeah so I would say one of the big things that I attempt to do is keep it as real as possible especially the friends that I've had forever they don't ever see a change in me I don't treat them any why would I right because that's just not me anyway so it's like I feel like they expect me to treat or do something different and I think I squashed it really fast like yo homie like, we was cool when I was seven. Why would I treat you any different? It right. doesn't matter if I've got one more zero in my bank account of you. I don't care. Right. Like, you know what right. I mean? They usually care more than you care. And so I think that that's one of the things about so you think you know money, you want to blow up. Well, guess what? When you blow up, oh, man. there's a lot of people that didn't blow up at the same time. So just be mindful that in those situations. Hey, I, I try. Well, it's not even – I, sometimes I don't even know if it's hater. I think it's just – 
is like human nature sometimes, John. Yeah, you know? yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're you know what I mean. And so, so I, so I try to go. I guess the moral of my story is that I try to go out of my way sometimes to squash that, just to make everybody clear. Like, yo, I ain't forgot that I was the dude driving the Omni the same time as you was driving the Escort. Well, like, and you know what I mean? this, the reason I have what I have is while you were uh, playing Mario on Nintendo 64, I was humping it. I was grinding. So when you were smoking exactly. weed on the couch and all your friends were over, I was in a coal mine, okay? Yeah. That's why I have this. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And so I don't really say that, but I think that's understood. But I agree <laughs> with you. You know what I mean? It's, but that's, that's part of, I think, like people got to know that money does change people in multiple different ways. So a lot of people don't know how to interact around it. So just be mindful. And we've got a lot com- coming up in that chapter, John. Oh, and I think my it'll God. Help out. We got to do that. That chapter is nasty. And I'll tell you guys, this book, the point is to make you not want to be an entrepreneur. Because if you can make it through it and yeah. still want to be an entrepreneur, then you are one. Yeah, agreed. All right, next, we're going to move on to a new segment called the Icon Spotlight because we believe this is obviously an educational podcast. Yeah. And there's people that John and I both either have you know, researched, read about, or would like to research and educate you guys about. And so John's going to educate us on a guy named Cornell West today. And I don't know much about Cornell, so John, I'm yeah. excited to learn. So Absolutely. Teach, brother. Teach. Yeah. Cornell West is a... First off, he's a humanitarian. I know he is a professor at Harvard and I believe Princeton, but that's not what Cornell West is. Cornell West is a public figure who is a modern day philosopher. Okay, um, he's an African American gentleman. He looks like he looks like uh, like an abolitionist. He's got a really cool look to him, and 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 he's got a really cool vibe to him. And, and he's a very, he's, he's a very, uh, he's got a great vibe. He's got a very loving vibe. He's got a very caring vibe. But bro, you, if, if you want to talk to that guy about the issues, you want to debate him, you better be ready because he knows everything. That guy knows everything. And, you know, I didn't know who he was about eight years ago. And I saw him on a TV show. And the first thing that struck me is, man, that dude's kind of dope looking. He looks like he's from the 1800s, you know? Yeah. So, so I, yeah. I started I'm yeah. looking at him and I started listening to him. And there's few, there's very few people that when they talk, I just stop. And he, uh, Cornel West is definitely one of those people. And it started with the appearance and it evolved into the words. And he was just, it was like, it was like he was playing with the other person that he was talking to because he knew they just had one one hundredth of the knowledge that he did and he didn't want to embarrass him on TV. And I was like, this guy is on another level. He's on a new level. He's got a shovel, dude. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, and, and, and watching people like that talk, he talk, I mean, he talks about everything from civil rights to, to you, you, you know, loving your neighbor, to, 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 to political issues. There's nothing that man doesn't talk about. So I know I'm speaking broadly about him, but it's because he's so well-rounded and, and it's the kind of guy who you just want to sit there and ask him questions because you know, when he answers it, dude, like he's going to be able to tell you a personal story that's connected to it. He was, he might even have been there. Like, yeah. like, you know what I'm saying? Like, he's just one of those OGs in, in in a non-criminal way. He's a gangster of knowledge. That's what I would, I'll call him. I didn't see, like, I, I did some brief, you know, background uh, kind of look on him, Wikipedia and Twitter and that. I didn't see him comment on Muhammad Ali. I would be really interested to hear on what that level of a thinker believes yeah. Muhammad Ali you know, meant to this Oof. nation and the world. I bet it'd be deep as shit, right? Oh, dude, dude, there's nothing he talks about that's not deep as shit. Like, yeah. I, that, that's what I love from people, right? I, I, I hate when people say, oh, 
I want Hillary Clinton to be president because she's a strong leader. Shut up. Shut your mouth. She's a strong. Yeah. What does that mean to me? What does that mean to you? That's that's fucking giggling goo. That's garbage. Don't tell me she's a strong leader. Tell me why. Yeah. Tell me Where's why the substance? she's a strong leader. Give me something, man. And that's yeah. what he brings every time. He brings something. And he gives you so much. And, and, and you learn. Every time the man talks, you learn. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be looking up Cornell West yeah, dude. after the podcast. Boss. Excellent. Well, John, it's time for some parting shots, brother. So yes. I'm going to start us off. So yes. I want to say a couple things about this episode. One, I love the segments outlined even more so. We're, we're evolving, John. We're evolving, which Always. is good. Always. We, we got some great things coming up from a production standpoint. I'm excited oh, about. Yeah. Um, We'll, we owe it to the listeners, I think, to be in person, us together a little bit more, which we're going to start working on so we can get – because I think we're even funnier when we're in the same room. Oh, dude, we do Kung Fu live. I mean we have live – yeah. and we, so, squat, we squat every day on the podcast. <laughs> so I just I – wanna, I want to let you guys know that we have every show the best intention to try to impact you guys – as much as possible with all these different segments. Like John said to me before we came on the show, dude, we need a spotlight on just some smart dudes that I know that you know that can help educate these young people and young souls and old souls. And I was like, dude, icon spotlight. He's like, you know, I love this guy. We've never talked about anybody like that before. Like we're always thinking of ways that not only can we make ourselves better, but can we spread it out to you guys? And so just know when you share the podcast with somebody, we're going to add a nugget to their life. There is no doubt in my mind right. that between the two of us, they will grab something from what we are teaching or the awareness that we're you know, coming out with. And so I just ask you guys, share the podcast, retweet it, Instagram it, text your friend. Like, I just appreciate that, and I believe that it's all for just the, the greater good. So, John, it's you. Love it. Great message, man. Um, you know – what I'd like to say is we're all different and we're all gifted in our own right. And we're all beautiful in our own way. And we can't change who we are. We can change the way we behave. We can change things like that, but we can't change who we are. We can't change our fiber. We can't change our DNA. And, um, with this recent despicable mass shooting, it really got me thinking about people hating themselves because it's reported that the guy who perpetrated the, the, the shooting was possibly homosexual and he shot up a bunch of homosexual people because he hated the fact he was homosexual. First off, if you're homosexual, that's fine, bro. That's fine. If, you, if, if, you're, if you're anything... And you respect other people yep. and respect their boundaries outside of, obviously, uh, painkillers and, 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 and prescription drugs. That's fine. Like, we have to understand we have one life, man. We have one life. So if you're sitting there letting your days go by and not saying, oh, I did this today. Oh, I learned that today. Oh, I shared this experience. Like, you're cheating yourself, man. So, so the first thing you got to do if you're stuck in that rut, and I know a lot of you guys are, it is accept yourself and say, it's okay to be me. Whatever you are. Me, I'm a crazy, like, like uh, you, you know, just, just, just high, strong guy who can't stop his mind, right? Like, that's me. I've accepted it, right? I try to, I try to work on the parts that I interact with people on. But that's me. And you know what? Like, you got to learn to love yourself. Like, I, I, I love me, right? Like, 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 love yourself, and then you can really start having real relationships with people. And um, I think with all the um, community-based knowledge that Corey referenced that we're going to keep bringing to you, and, 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 and all the sharing, all the familia keeps sharing with their friends, the podcast, whether it be through social media or whatever. Thank you guys for that. All, all, all that stuff's so important, and, and please keep doing it because 
This isn't the John and Corey show. This is the Familia show, man. Like you guys contribute to it. You know, we're going to contribute to it. And, and let's just keep, let's keep building this thing because the only thing, the only thing that's come of it is positive. To this day, I have not gotten one negative message. One negative message on Instagram. Yep. I haven't gotten one. Dude, thank you guys. We love you guys. You are listening to Activate Radio. We are Activate Media. And this is Fun Friday. So go out, have some fun, get re-energized, and let's hit this up Monday, baby. Let's do it.